The serene squall brings back to Pring for anyone who missed her. She's at a Vulcan jail, helping with rehabilitation, and also reading books from Earth about sexuality. Not surprising, Spock has not sought out any literature where sex is really explored, though I have to tell you I can completely picture Una with an entire shelf of them and some with corrections handwritten in. Nurse Chapel can't help but notice that Spock's distracted, and so gives him more romantic advice, which we'll call a wash given her track record, but for Spock, any help, no matter what, would likely improve things. At dinner, there's discussion of a mission for some stranded colonial ships that are in a pretty bad way. This sector is the Quadrant's version of the Wild Wild West. So, risk assessment. Kettle rustlers are a virtual certainty, Captain. They arrive and find out that two of the three ships have been killed, and Laan suspects the likely thing the pirates came for were the colonists themselves to serve as slave labor. And with two days to get a message back to Starfleet this far from the relayed network, they're going to be on their own if they follow. But of course they will, leaving some buoys behind to try to stay in contact. After the titles... I'm going to hate the next few minutes, aren't I? The captain has been trying to reach you. Your presence is requested on the bridge. Wow, I honestly thought this was going to be the awkward romantic relationship conversation in a bar while highly repetitive generic dance music thumps in the background. I don't know if this is a bait and switch or just a sign that I have low expectations, but I gotta say, anything compared to that scene is an improvement. Spock needs Aspen to come to the bridge. Pike's been trying to reach her about the missing colonists. On the way, they discuss Kolinar, the Vulcan technique of purging all emotions from oneself, like working for the DMV. There's a distress signal, which could be the colonists, or could be pirates luring them into a trap, which I'd have to say... Yeah, this was more of what I was expecting, and it delivered. They're caught inside this net, and it's shrinking, and likely something's going to explode if they break one of the connections. It's kind of like a really high-stakes game of operation. Spock narrows down the asteroid that's creating the net to one of two, but destroying the wrong one will set off the trap. Spock has to go with a hunch of which one it is. Luckily, he gets it right. As McCoy would later say, his guesses are better than other people's facts. Well, Aspen swings by Spock's quarters after that. Oh, aren't you half-human? That is merely genetics. I was raised on Vulcan. And that's geography. Astrometry. Not to mention sociology. Being raised in Tokyo is going to be different than being raised in Wyoming. She gets philosophical about expectations and identity, and this would be interesting to explore if not for the fact that this is very odd behavior. Aside of being present at the same dinner, they've shared exactly two experiences, a turbo lift ride and a group crisis on the bridge. It seems very odd, then, to presume based upon that that you can just go to this person in private and have this discussion about such a personal matter. I mean, if you're thinking, well, this is just an excuse to have this, let me put it another way. How would it come across to you if she came in here and said, I saw you were afraid on the bridge, so I wanted to ask you, have you given any thought to the Church of Scientology? If you're inclined to say those aren't the same thing, what else is it but to observe a total stranger to you, go in there, and then challenge their very identity with an assertion of what you think it is? Now you can say, well, we know why she would do this, because it's revealed based upon her actions later on. Yes, but that then overshadows any point that was trying to be made by the conversation. I'm not thinking, that lady's got some really interesting and valid points. I'm instead thinking, man, check out this weirdo. So the only thing that comes out of this that does make sense is her saying that the trap is not going to offer any clues because the Serene Squall pirates didn't lay it. If they had, they'd have shown up and collected the spoils or finished the job. Pirates aren't lazy. I mean, just think about how long it must take to teach a parrot to talk. They find the colonist ship with plenty of people aboard, but it looks like there are already pirates there, too. Pike leads an armed away team to try to rescue the colonists and fight the pirates if necessary. Only, there are no colonists. What's more, while they beamed over, pirates beamed over to their ship. 
Comms are cut off with the away team, and then they're caught in an ambush. It seems like the traps are really piling up around here. I mean, you need an entire chorus of Admiral Akbars at this rate. The Enterprise bridge is taken, and Spock has to withdraw with Aspen, but luckily the controls have been locked out. Unluckily, <laughs> pirates tend not to be squeamish. After all, they are willing to eat this guy's cooking. Although when Pike offers to cook them a proper meal to perhaps discuss things, the crew is all for it. Back on the Enterprise, Chapel is still free. Freeze! Well, that was a short-lived rescue plan. <laughs> ah, when you don't have a medical phase or break out the old Tranquando. Pike uses the opportunity to talk with the captain about what a mistake this whole thing is. Although the captain does seem to know his situation pretty well. Yeah, the Federation is going to come looking, looking for the ship, and looking for the people that have both already been sold off. So the Serene Squall will be long gone. That does depend on Pike not giving up the codes, though. We'll have to see if that can last longer than it takes for the Federation to come looking for them. Otherwise, they're stuck towing this thing around looking for a space chop shop or something. Back on the Enterprise, Aspen gives her backstory that her husband was a Vulcan who skipped his colonar, and she took this job to try and find him, saying that the pirates probably got him because he fought rather than running. That's why they need to abandon ship. As Spock works on die-harding this thing, Pike gives everyone the good news. I convinced these guys to sell us to the Klingons. Hey, this day is looking up. Una gets what he's going for, a mutiny, get the crew to realize the captain's plan is so reckless that they'll act, and then the Enterprise crew can act, and in the midst of all the acting, they'll be able to act like a tree and leave. Spock's already working on it, finding chapel and engineering, failing to get the distress signal sent. The lockdown has to be released first, which I think we can all agree is a bit of a design flaw. If you're in a situation where the ship needs to have its controls locked, odds are good sending a distress signal is called for. In fact, it really ought to be automatic, like those devices on boats that, if they detect your sinking, automatically calls for help to come and save you, since that's a time you definitely need it, and very, very few times when it happens and you don't. Like you've found a lost civilization that has invented something that tastes like a Snickers bar and holds back the aging process. Well, there's not enough of it to go around, and even then, you could just take the damn thing out of your boat first. This episode is, in fact, a demonstration of why it's bad to not set an automatic distress signal. Because in order to do so, Spock undoes the lockdown, and then Aspen reveals herself to be Captain Angel the Pirate, which sounds like something a four-year-old girl would come up with for Halloween. I'm a captain, and a pirate, and an angel, and cartoons. Now there is a Dr. Aspen. She was dumped on a planet when Captain Angel took her place. No, no, I'm not calling her Captain Angel. It sounds like a superhero from a Jack Chick tract. Fighting for truth! Justice, and not touching yourself down there. She lured them out here with a story of fake colonists, but while the ship is a nice bonus, Angel really just wants Spock. She calls up to Pring, saying there's someone named Zabarius at the prison, a rehabilitation center, to Pring insists, although any place where you're not allowed to leave, I think really is a prison. She wants to trade Spock for Zabarius, but to Pring says she can't. What's more, Spock points out that T'Pring is not going to be swayed by emotions. Seriously? I've been using emotion to sway you all day. Oh, those poor sick colonists. Wow, this character's antics almost makes me pine for the outrageous Okana. And there's a difference between being resistant to emotions and lacking any sense of empathy. I've helped people while they were irritating me at the time. Because despite the negative emotions I had, I also knew what was a moral duty as a member of the human race. Or as another example, there is nobody that I personally know whom I would not express sympathy to sincerely if they had cancer. Even if they were people I not only didn't like, but knew I didn't like them. If I could do those things while feeling negative emotions... Vulcans can certainly do the same with no feelings whatsoever. We cut over to Pike and company pouring poison into the ears of the most vocal resistant to the acting captain. Then get back to the rendezvous with T'Pring's ship. Seems she's coming after all. 
Well, Spock is an opinion on that. But it holds little sway on the captain. Spock can't let her do this, though, and so he devises a plan, apologizing in advance to Chapel for what he's about to do. As Spock moves forward, Chapel gets it and joins in, saying that they have been doing the space nasty behind T'Pring's back. They even do a passionate kiss right there on the bridge. Well, T'Pring buys it. Vulcans, as a general rule, don't lie. Except, you know, when duty requires it. Tuvok would have made a pretty terrible plant in Chakotay's Maquis cell if he had to answer, are you a spy, with, of course. T'Pring goes to leave, and before Angel can do anything, the Serene Squall shows up and uses the backdoor codes to take down the Enterprise, like in Wrath of Khan. So with failure all around, Angel beams herself to this nearby ship we'd seen tagging along earlier and escapes. Oh, good. Sure would hate to think there's no chance I'd ever see her again. Why, who would irritate me now that Neelix is gone? Arg, me mateys. If we ever catch Angel... We should make them walk the plank, Arg. And suddenly, there's a challenger on the field. T'Pring swings by, ensuring everything is okay between them. She saw through the ruse, but figured if Spock was doing it, she should play along. Because there is definitely no chemistry between him and Chapel. Zero, zilch, nada. Whatever is the opposite of Walter White, that's what they have. All that leaves, then, is the revelation of who Zabarius' real identity is. It's Cybok. Oh, Lord. Did we have to keep that thing in the cannon? Ugh, no thanks. The Serene Squall is... Boy, if I thought I was taking a pummeling by expressing that I don't care for Ortegas, I'm about to be beaten while the police turn a blind eye. A month or so back, I did an Enterprise Bad Guys Take Over the Ship episode and was not kind to it. This episode is better than that. But not anything particularly remarkable either. Hell, I I'm just going to drop it right here on the deck right now and get it over with. The WGA strike is a worry about AI writing scripts. But frankly, this feels like what an AI would write. It is just, it's so surface. It's so naked in its intent. I'm just not particularly impressed. Don't get me wrong, it's fine. But that's all it is to me. It's just fine. I mean, it's, it's a perfectly serviceable 50 minutes of television, but that's all that it is. I overall like Strange New Worlds, but intellectual honesty tells me that if this had been another series that had this episode, I'd probably be more negative about it. More of this whole things might ha must happen this way in the script would have annoyed me more. I know that people will probably say, oh, but it's got into Spock's duality. Oh, it got into the Spock Chapel thing. And yeah, but the former is done often and better than this. And the latter, yeah, it works. It was a high point. But the majority of pieces are either plot conveniences or not sufficiently explored to really elevate this for me. I wouldn't turn it off, but I wouldn't put it on either. It's an inoffensive 50 minutes to me, and that's it. That's all it ever will be. Your head is not scrambled. Yeah, well, more good news. I convinced these guys to sell us to the Klingons. 